All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and, and welcome uh, to the sixth annual Tech Week YQG. I'm thrilled to be here with you all today as part of this week long celebration of our regional tech community. My name is Adam Castle, and I serve as the Director of Venture Services here at WeTech Alliance. And I have the pleasure of overseeing the design and delivery of advisory services that we provide to our community. For those of you that are new here to Tech Week YQG, Tech Week YQG is a series of collaborative events spearheaded by WeTech Alliance. And this week brings together tech leaders, founders, talent, researchers, investors, expats, and the broader community. Tech Week YQG is a fantastic opportunity to share knowledge, network, and learn from each other. So I encourage you to take full advantage of the various sessions, keynotes, and workshops that we have planned throughout the week. This week would not have been made possible without our generous sponsors and partners, and I'd like to thank the province of Ontario, the Government of Canada, Invest Windsor Essex, SnapP, Idea Fund, University of Windsor, Little Heart Social, Plug and Drive, the Ontario Vehicle Integration Network, and Ontario Centers for Innovation, and Next Innovations, as well as Spoken Artists. For more information about our sponsors, please check out wetech-alliance.com slash techweekyqg. Now, over the past five years, Tech Week YQG has brought together some of the brightest minds in the industry to discuss important themes such as cross-border partnerships, diversity, equity, inclusion, technology predictions, mobility, and so much more. And new this year, we're excited to introduce a new theme, green technologies, as we strive to make a positive impact on our environments. Today, though, we're focusing in on founders, you, and our discussion will be aimed at giving you insights into how much or how you can launch your business through validation and market testing, which in turn can help you save countless dollars and hours at those earliest stages of your startup journey. Now to the housekeeping items. To be considerate and accommodate everyone attending today, we're doing things just a little bit differently uh, through this meetup by leveraging Zoom webinar. You might wanna be able to see all the attendees, but you are gonna have opportunity to engage with our guests during the Q&A session. So please feel free to use that chat feature located at the bottom of the video window to engage with session attendees. You may submit questions at any time throughout the session using that Q&A box located in the bottom of the display window, and you can upvote the questions you wanna see answered. Should you experience any technical difficulties, send a message in the chat. We have Emily Roback on the WeTech team standing by. I should be happy to, to take a, um, a look at your uh, difficulties or comments or concerns um, and address those. Now this session will be recorded, a video file, an audio file, and relevant links will be available on WeTech Alliance's YouTube channel and included in the attendee follow-up email. So if you miss anything, don't worry, we've got you covered. Finally, let's make sure everyone knows that Tech Week YQG is where it's at. Be sure to share hashtag Tech Week YQG experiences on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Now I'd like to welcome in our speaker today, Stephen Fike, founder and president of Snappy, to the virtual stage. Stephen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know what? Let's start off. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to be the holder of over 240 U.S. patents. Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm the founder and creative director of SnapP Design. Uh, we focus on product design and development. We've been doing this for eight years or so. Um, I, my background, I actually started off uh, mechanical, moved to hardware, moved to software, and then got into user experience. Uh, I, was a, I was a BlackBerry guy, like a lot of people from the Waterloo region, um, and spent a lot of time actually learning about how to do product development really well, how, how design impacts sales and things like that. Um, and then after that came out and started Snap P because honestly, we, we kind of identified that there was a lot of people who wanted to build hardware companies originally, and they didn't really have the skill set or knowledge to do that. And then we came in and started supporting those teams. And that's kind of how we started off and grow. Really cool. I, honestly, if I had a dollar for every time I met someone that was totally awesome at their job and what they do and came out of BlackBerry as, <laughs> as one of those, those shade offs, uh, just fantastic. So Stephen, I'm super excited to sort of dive into our conversation today. Um, but today's session is actually really special for us because I've got to share a little bit about the partnership that we just launched. Um, so we don't just have you and your insights as a guest here for Tech Week, um, but as officially announced last week that WeTech and SnapP have launched a brand new partnership in 2023, um, which really aims to give our eligible clients access to knowledge that you've accumulated over these decades and your team um, in that product design and development space. Um, you know, you start with this idea that every good product starts with an argument, and that's the name of the course that our clients are going to get access to. And what it'll aim to do is take our founders through a tried and tested methodology of how to test products in market without having to invest their life savings or years of their time 
into these activities that may not lead to a business that they hope to create in the first place. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited for this partnership and, and so excited to dive in with you today. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly thrilled that the, the program that we've been developing over the last several years has started to take off. Um, the impact it's had on people, the feedback we've gotten has been wonderful. And I'm, I'm really excited to deliver it down to the WeTech Alliance as well. Fantastic. So Stephen, you know, you, you touched a little bit about why you started Snappy, what that genesis was, but maybe let's frame it in the terms of you see problems and you're a guy that likes to tackle those problems sort of head on. What were those big problems that you saw that that you thought, you know, Snappy needed to solve for the, the market? Well, so yeah, like I, I think when we started, it was more of just trying to support startups. Um, you know, being weirdly a startup ourselves, we saw an opportunity to collaborate and work with people and it was really helping them get over a bunch of really common problems in the startup ecosystem. And I will also say the thing that I love is that I, I that statement of arguments. I love arguments. I think arguments are the greatest. And the word itself around arguments is something that people kind of feel a little bit weird and awkward around because it's a it's an aggressive word. But I also love that notion of being a little bit awkward because that's how you know that there's growth. And so when we start talking about good product development. You know, even when you start looking at the beginning of SnapP to what it is today, it's built off of arguing around what the best principles are, what we should be doing and why. And so in a way, I look back at what, how we started SnapP and I, I can tell you all of the things that we did wrong. And what I love is that we have a culture of just growth, right? That the, the mantra here is be better. It's not about competing directly. It's not about any of those things. It's about being better as individuals, which helps us be better as a team, which helps the company be better. So what we originally started with is it was, you know, trying to support startups. And where we are now is that, you know, we really want to help the, the, the entire ecosystem, the startup ecosystem grow. We want to help it improve and change uh, the old methods that, you know, people rely on aren't always the thing that really matters anymore. And so we want to really push that notion of like, let's leverage new tools. Let's, let's change our programming whenever we need to, to make sure we're taking advantage of the things that are current and recent. And honestly, really help people go through those struggles of startups, right? Like starting a business yeah. sucks. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. And like, I have friends who say, oh yeah, you're your own boss. You must love it. I'm like, no, it's a terrible thing. But once you start, you can't stop. And what I want to do is help people in that transition, right? Make it so that they're not alone. Make it so that they have confidence when they go in and not just, you know, my friends told me this is a great idea, but real actual market feedback saying that it's a problem we're solving. And so we've evolved a lot from where we started, but I'm, I'm always looking to like, what's the next thing and what do we need to do? And so for me, SnapP is on a constant growth path, this, the same way that all of the employees here are. Very cool. And, you know, I think you see that thread through a lot of the entrepreneurs that you work with and, and entrepreneurs that we work with at WeTech as well is um, those folks that aren't, a, aren't afraid to be wrong. And I think that's that's such the ethos of what an argument is, right? If you're you're gentering it into you for the right reasons, you're not afraid to be called out on things that, that may be wrong or, or maybe looking at things from a different perspective. And so I agree. I think, you know, there is that negative connotation around arguments. Um, and as a people pleaser myself, sometimes it's hard to, to get into those types of situations. Um, but also you realize that that's where the growth is found and that's where that that's you know growth together sometimes is found too our team some of the best moments that have come out of our team in the last five years are times when we've all sat around a table and argued about what's important to us and where we're headed next um and really setting you know, that pathway forward um, through that sort of discussion, right? And heated debate. And, and also too, you want to be around people that are passionate. And if you're not passionate, you're not going to argue. And so, you know, you're someone that's filled with passion and filled with sort of this uh, desire to do, you know, a greater good for the folks that you're working for. Um, I imagine getting into an argument with you is, is quite the experience. Mm -hmm. um, so tell so, me a little bit about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So the, the one thing I will say is that, uh, and we'll probably get into this at some point in time because it's a it's a passion uh, topic for me, is that I, I love that terminology of arguments and I do love arguments and I'm the personality type who loves to argue, but I'm also a huge fan of personality profiling to understand like how different people like to have arguments because sometimes an argument can be had where I propose a challenge. Sometimes it can be asking a question but I think the big thing that you that you kind of caught on in that beginning part is that 
it's about being open to being wrong. Like I'm, I'm a person who has very strong beliefs, but they're kind of one of those things where once that belief has been shattered because somebody gave me some great information, well, now I'm going to adopt that belief and carry on. And that's kind of that goal is that I really strongly believe in arguments, but it's about having ones that are constructive, having ones that are, you know, understanding of the people around you, but it's always about that growth mentality. Absolutely. I think there's a really great sort of test that you can use when, whenever you're getting into that, that kind of conversation with someone. And it's starting the conversation with asking them, like, what would I have to show you? What would I be able to do in order to change your mind on something? If they're not able to change their mind, then, then the argument's probably not going to go anywhere. But if you're able to give them information that they can use and form a different or a new opinion, that it's definitely worth having, you know? So um, I just think that's super interesting the way you come at it. And, and maybe this is a good place to start with our conversation. What does this mean in the context of the business? So why does every good product start with an argument? What are those arguments that products have to make in order to start making an impact with what they want to do? So what, and actually we kind of came up with this process through years of work and understanding on the, on the market and all that. Um, but the thing that we've kind of come to realize is that there's a lot of fantastic tools. There's a lot of great ways of leveraging information to really find out if the problem you're trying to solve is valid. And, and I don't mean, you know, it's a real problem. We see this all the time where, especially from engineering led companies where they've discovered a problem and it's a very real problem. The difference is, is about understanding how people in the market approach that problem, because it could be something where you're solving a very real problem thing that exists from a technical perspective, but the average consumer, the, the target market that you're going after just doesn't see it. They don't, they're not aware. And so a lot of times it's about not pivoting your product, but pivoting the story you're telling. So we really like to focus on making sure that we're not just making assumptions and, you know, asking people that we know, we're actually going out and gathering real market feedback. And the nice thing is that you don't even have to have a product built. We can do this testing early and often and get a really clear understanding of like what you need to do in order to solve a real problem and address that market and then build something that will strongly resonate. It's, it's not just about build it and they will come. It's about understand why they're going to come first and then build to that. Very cool. And so really it comes down to value, right? What value are you able to communicate in a way that people understand so that they're able to grasp the concepts that you're sort of putting together. And I think what you said there is so important. And it's something that we coach a lot at WeTech with our clients. It's this idea that just because you have a great idea doesn't mean that the people that you want to get it in front of are going to understand what pain point it's actually solving for them. Or are they going to understand it in the time that they're going to give that they have to, to sort of understand this product in the first place, right? Some people only have, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds for they're making a decision on something. You got to give them enough of that value in that time frame uh, for them to make a decision to, to learn more, to want to dive a little bit deeper. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of uniqueness in how you approach this design process um, in this specifically in this way of like test it before you build. Um, tell us a little bit more about what that customer discovery process looks like at Snappy and how do you choose which companies you're actually going to work with? Well, so yeah, the customer discovery for, for my clients or for us, because those are two different things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no. Uh, do it for you first. How do you sort of go through that process of figuring out whether or not, you know, one of your products or one of your, your potential customers has a product that's something that you're, you're willing to work on. Yeah. So we, we love to, we love to leverage data. Um, the thing is that I'm, I've always been a huge fan of UX research. Um, user experience research is about understanding how people interact with the world, what they do on a daily basis, but also how they describe it. And you know, it was always one of those things that was hard for us to convince people to do because it feels extremely, you know, qualitative. It's, it's, it doesn't have the metric that they care about. Mm -hmm. Or what we do now is we focus on making sure that we still do a lot of that qualitative UX research, but we've, we've developed a method of taking, you know, what people say and how they describe things and turn it into something that we can test and iterate on really quickly, leveraging, you know, ad networks or, um, other different methods of trying to push content out. And what we're doing now is we're taking, you know, instead of asking people, hey, I have this product, it'll do this thing, do you want to buy it? We ask them about, you know, what their what their job looks like, how they interact with the world, how they seek help. Um, I, I love to talk about love-hate questions where, you know, if I ask you about your job, great, but now I'm going to ask you what you love about your job because that's going to help 
inform your aspirations and you know understand what your goals are. And I'm going to love ask you about what you hate about your job because those are the problems that you see on a day to day basis. And and like you said earlier, it's that top of mind pain point, that problem, right? And if I can tell a story about how my product solves the thing that you're already actively searching for, you know, I've I've got a great opportunity to sell something. So that process is a lot of, you know, making sure we understand who those people are, making sure we understand what their aspirations and pain points are, and then reframing the story of the product so that it serves that need, right? I love that your approach to this process and, and approach to working with customers is almost a mirror of the, the process that you create for them to, to deliver their, their products. Um, it's this idea that they really just have to sort of dive in and deeply understand what it is they're solving for in order to deliver that, that sort of value. So, you know, Stephen, I'm an entrepreneur. Maybe I'm not at that, that level yet where I can engage in a snappy. Um, but what are some of the things that I should be considering as I start out in that product development space? Well, so I'm going to now, of course, argue that there's no such thing as too early to engage in the in the programming. Um, and and honestly, we've actually been leveraging. So the programming that we have that we, we've partnered with you on uh, is something that we developed internally. And we've just kind of uh, formalized it so it could be broadcast, right? So that we could actually get other people to use it. The, the whole notion of like getting engaged at an early stage is, is literally about trusting data. Um, I mean... Man, I have some fantastic stories from from clients who have leveraged that data to do everything from you know convince investors to buy in to you know help show that there's real market traction. But it's that thing of testing, right? Like the thing I love the most is testing, relying on real data, real market data, and and using that to inform your decisions. The thing that we can do is once you understand some of the methodology of how to test your assumptions. You can get into a place where you're not just testing the core value proposition. You can test features, benefits, value. You can test all kinds of different things. So when you're just starting out, the most critical thing is being open to being wrong, right? Uh, we we ran in the early days, we ran a quick trial. We took a bunch of founders who already had a product or were developing a product and got them to test a whole bunch of pain points. And honestly, like 90% of the pain points came back as wrong. And what we can do is leverage this, this testing methodology, this rapid iteration. And I love iteration at the early stages. Nobody wants to be changing a product when it's just about to be released. So focusing on encouraging that argument, that iteration, that change, the challenge in the early stages helps you have a better, more clear product development process. So for us, that really early step is just be open to being wrong and figure out a great way to test, validate all of your assumptions. I'm going to throw one more thing in here is that, you know, mentorship is great. I've been a mentor for a long time, but mentors still provide assumptions. They don't have proof. They, they try their best and they leverage, you know, years of history and knowledge, but every market and every product is always a little bit different. So even if you get something that feels like the best advice ever, still test, just prove that they're right or prove that they're wrong and then move forward. How do you help an entrepreneur to feel comfortable with the data that they're getting from these tests? So the idea of, you know, well, is this enough? Do I have enough information to either move forward or, or to pivot? Or should I be pivoting? How do I know when I've collected sort of enough information to, to make a move and make a decision? So we, we have a bunch of metrics that we use uh, in, the, in the course, but really that, and again, this is the reason why I love this course, but uh, it's about we have some clearly defined metrics of like how you get people to engage and what those are and when you have something that's considered a win. And it's like, if you don't get those wins, there's a lot of people who don't see the the, the metrics that they want to see. And they kind of go, no, no, I know I'm right. <laughs> but those who pivot get traction way faster. And it's, it's not because, and like, this is another weird thing is that sometimes it's not that the solution is different in any way. It's just that they're telling a better story. They're solving that top of mind pain point that people are actually actively searching for. And you tell them about how your solution solves that problem and they engage. And it goes from that struggle of outbound of, hey, can I talk to you for 20 minutes? So I'm gonna pitch you on this idea into the beauty of inbound, right? Like when all of a sudden people are actively searching for you, that is a glorious thing. 
yeah, there's, there's no better feeling as an entrepreneur when you're getting found by customers to sort of move into this. But as you say, you have to focus in on what that messaging is first. You have to be able to connect with that audience in, in a really meaningful way. Um, when you look at, you know, you're moving through this process of, of developing out that, that validation, you're gathering things, you're testing the market, um, companies will often jump into that space of, well, I need, I need funding to make this happen. I need to, to dive into this funding space. And one of the tropes that we've really focused on in, in the last, you know, certainly the last few years, and, and even more so now with the climate on funding, is, is you have to find traction first. Get traction, bootstrap as much as you can in those early stages in order to figure out whether or not, you know, the market's actually going to accept your product. Um, when you see this design or sorry, this process being used, how is it, you mentioned it, it's helped some of your clients or customers um, actually go on and find investment because they have this data. How are they using this data to actually do that, that sort of follow on piece to, to prove out what they have is something that's worth investing in? So it's actually, that's a great question because it is, a couple different factors that that feed into this. One is that you'll get a lot of people who tell you, in, investors, mentors, whoever, who will come out and say, well, you have to build your product to test it in market. Once you've done that, we'll, we'll give you some cash. And now if you're a software company, okay, great. If you have all the skill sets, maybe you can go build it yourself. But that's a, it's difficult, especially if it's a large scale product. Hardware companies, it's hard because you need cash to move the product forward. The thing is, is that with, you know, all of the wonderful things about the internet and terrible things about the internet, there's a way now of being able to go out and prove traction without even that investment of that, of the massive product. In, in fact, we have a client that uh, sometime last year, we ran a, a pricing test and the product was an idea, but we could still render an image. We could still drive traffic. We could still validate that people will go and show up. And the lovely thing is that when you start talking about investors and what they're looking for, they want traction. But if I can show them that there's a there's a real need, and I can I can pull people in for you know a few cents, and you know like getting a hundred people on my page costs uh, let's say twenty dollars. Like that's that's an amazing thing, especially if you can show them intent. Right, like, oh, I look at how they flowed. I mean, the GA four Google Analytics four is a is a thing. A lot of people hate it. Uh, I personally love it right now. Um, but you can look at how traffic moves through a site. You can leverage a bunch of known statistics around how many people buy after they look at a product. But you can leverage a bunch of known analytics and show intent and show uh, the decision to make a purchase. Hell, you can collect cash and refund them right away. But there's a lot of different ways that you can validate that there is interest in your product long before you have a product ready. Now, it's different. There's different industries, selling direct to consumers, selling B2B, selling to institutions. But the process still holds. It's still about proving traction before, you have, before you've spent you know, half a million dollars to build a product that you don't really know if people are going to buy. For sure. You know, something we share in common, I think, um, is really the frustration with the fundraising landscape. And so being in Windsor, Essex and Chatham, Kent, you know, a lot of the time capital is something that's top of mind for companies. But it's one of the hardest things to attract. We don't have the same level of investment here uh, that you would find in a Toronto or Waterloo. Why is something like this, this process and the course that you've created here, how does that help with democratizing that, that entire process of finding funding? So I, I have, this is a, I'll, I'll try not to stay on a soapbox for too long, but this is a problem in the industry, right? Um, like there's all kinds of evidence. There's there's great research that shows about the type of people who get funded and why. And one of the things that I find a lot is that people say things like, well, I'm going to invest in this person because they've done it before. But that doesn't mean that it was their idea that made the company successful. It could have been the team they hired. It could have been the market environment at the time. There's a million factors that go into making a successful product. And if you're not constantly testing, iterating, and proving that you're on the right path, a lot of that's luck. And so investing in people who've done it before, to me, feels a little misguided, where what I'd rather do is take a pure data approach, right? If I could show, regardless of who the founder is, right, as long as the founder is open to being wrong and is a decent person to work with, that's all I care about. Outside of that, it's just rely on the data. 
if I can prove that I can draw people into, you know, my offering, I can prove that the, the targeted market I'm going after cares about the problem I'm proposing and they will engage with, with my brand or my product in some meaningful way, that piece of data goes a long way. And we have stories coming out right now that is that there are, I mean, I can't wait to publish our whole series of results, but a lot of them are currently confidential. But we have people coming to us saying that they, they've been talking to an investor for six months. And the, the investor kept saying things like, well, you know, it's going to cost you $4 to get people to sign up to your application. There's no way this is going to be profitable. And what happens is that we can leverage real data to show that that's not right. We can show that, you know, maybe it costs 15 cents or whatever. And if we can show that as proof, like here, I'm going to open up my ad network. Here's, this is proof that this is what's going to happen. It changes the story. And now all of a sudden investors start to go, oh, okay. Like you've proven traction. You've proven that there is profitability. The thing I love is that we can prove that a product can make money before the product's even done. And that's something that's just, just wonderful because now from an investment standpoint, it's not a risk. There's hard facts that show this is going to be profitable over the, over the time. That's, it's so cool that you found this way, this pathway through this process where you're not investing your entire life savings as an entrepreneur, but also you're de-risking it for those investors who really do care about this stuff. They care about traction, um, but they care about it in different ways. And so it isn't necessarily, you know, a billion units sold is what they're looking at or a million dollars revenue ARR. It could really be this, this ability to team up with an entrepreneur that is willing to be wrong, willing to take risk and, and to make mistakes and to really pivot based on feedback, but then also look at companies that have this early traction. It's not necessarily these hard numbers, but it is proof positive that, that there's something there, that they are solving a pain point that can be, um, I think, really valuable for people. And, and that's really what it comes down to. So I want to do a little bit of myth busting here with you, Stephen. What are some of those really big misconceptions that you hear from clients that'll walk through your door and how do you address them at Snappy? What is that, you know, in product development, what are those sort of big myths that, that people come to you with um, thinking and, and how do you dispel them? <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding in terms of like how easy it is to get to market. I mean, the, the if you build it, they will come thing is a, is a mm -hmm. really common thing. But there's also um, startup myths that have been built up over time, right? Uh, talking about you know the the terminology of MVP, the minimum viable product, it's I mean it's another soapbox thing for me. Uh, I hate the terminology. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that talk about oh well, I'm going to create a minimum viable product. I'm like right, but if I can prove traction with a thing that's not a product and not viable, but I can get some traction like. Why wouldn't I do that? And, and why stop at one MVP and then release a full product? Why not do it iteratively and constantly make correction and make sure that we're doing the right thing as we're developing that product? So there's, there's some understanding that like, oh, well, as an entrepreneur, I'm going to come in. I'm going to have a million dollar idea. Somebody's going to give me some cash. I'm going to go out and make billions of dollars. That's not real, right? It's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's also about understanding that you probably have built this idea around some assumptions and you have to be open to being wrong. Now, there's some people I've met who've been great founders who you know, told me for sure that they were never wrong. But if you look at their story from when they began to when they end, it's always different, right? So they were open to being wrong. They just didn't want to admit that either. Uh, the thing is that there's this notion of like, oh, well, I, I, I've worked in this industry. I know for sure that this is a massive problem and they're probably right, but it also means that you know the problem to a degree that nobody else understands. Even the people in your industry might not understand the problem to the depth that you do. And so that's another thing that we really try and encourage people to do is even though you know your market and you know, and you have the expertise in that space, we still want you to do some testing because maybe people don't understand that that's the problem that they're facing. They think it's employee retention. They think it's training. They think it's whatever. And maybe we can figure out how to rephrase what that problem is to solve that problem that they're talking about, not the one that you know is fundamentally what's their issue, right? 
it sounds like a lot of what you do is help with articulation, where it's, you may know the problem better than anyone else, but if your colleagues in this space aren't able to articulate it in the same way, or maybe they're not able to articulate it in the way that you've identified it as, it's still going to be a miss. So until you learn to do that, that piece of it, where you're telling that narrative in a way that actually connects, you'll never know whether or not the product is something that's going to solve it, you know, or whether or not they identify yep. that pain point as something painful enough to, to want to sort of make a move on it or, or have some urgency behind behind their buying habits. Yeah, exactly. So when you look at, you know, those misconceptions and, and how they can be, um, you know, sort of sort of changed around and, and really reframed for, for folks, um, what are some of the strategies that you end up putting into place that, that you ensure that those product development projects um, are really, you know, hitting the mark? So how do you go about investigating what that messaging should look like? I imagine it's obviously a lot of testing, um, but, but what is that process specifically? So uh, the first thing is everybody always says, go talk to your customers. And a lot of people say, well, I've talked to my customers and they have, but there's a specific way that we've found where you can ask questions that are completely non leading, right? The, the problem with a lot of people is they say, well, I've talked to my customers, but they've probably introduced some level of bias and bias can be a killer because it gives you a whole bunch of false evidence that looks like it's going to be a massive success, but when you launch it into market, it doesn't work. So we love to kind of approach that uh, user experience research side to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what the needs are, what the top of mind pain points are, what their user aspirations are, but also understanding things like what are appropriate channels. If you start talking to people about how they solve problems, they might make reference to, you know, the IT person. And if they always make a constant reference back to that person, even though you're you're trying to solve a solution for them that happens to fit within, you know, the whatever, an application or something that they're going to leverage, that actually becomes a great indicator as a channel, right? Maybe it's that you can't sell to that person because they don't really understand the tech. Maybe it's that you need to sell to the IT people in the companies who can then roll it out and you can still talk about value proposition to, you know, the end users. So really kind of focusing on understanding behavior is a big part and then uh, we actually typically leverage a bunch of you know, advertising networks or things like that, but we do it from a perspective of really short, simple tests, right? So we're not talking about doing you know, thousands of dollars in paid advertising. Uh, and I'm, we use paid advertising because it's the fastest way to get a response, right? Um, but we're talking about doing small incremental tests, getting enough data, right? You want to be 80% right. Uh, and and having that flexibility to make changes as over time is, is imperative. But mm -hmm. just getting enough data, doing a short, simple test. Some of our tests, I mean, we've run tests that cost $30, right? And we can prove out opportunity for a couple hundred bucks. But what we want to do is just make sure that you are testing and iterating. And, and honestly, it's about control. It's about one variable at a time, right? How can we make incremental improvements? It's the same approach that that you know we take when we're trying to like optimize a website. It's not about making a massive change. It's about how can I make incremental improvements to make sure that what we're doing is constantly on track, on target, and something that people literally care about and are actively searching for. Um, so a lot of that is just, I mean, it's a simple answer of just iteration, testing, and controlling variables, but it ends up being so valuable to you know, all of our clients, but also just to the individuals to get confidence that they're doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. We find that confidence is such a key, right? And once you feel a little bit of it, it's so much easier to keep, you know, keep putting your neck out a little bit and, and not fearing that risk as much and, and fearing that rejection. You know, you, you've sort of done this really great job at um, putting together almost an edited model of what that additional, you know, or initial build, measure, learn sort of loop looks like, right? You, you talk about lean methodology and lean startup methodology, and a lot of uh, a lot of places, accelerators included, will teach that sort of school of thought where you're going to build something, you measure how it performs, and then and then you learn, right? But the way you've kind of come at this is the idea that you're you're really you're test, measure, learn, build. There's four pieces to that, where it's not so much about, you know, the initial build as it is, it's testing the ideas before there's anything that's concrete or before there's anything sort of uh, in, in focus. 
and then building on top of that, building and then measuring and then and then learning from from that experience kind of thing. Um, that iterative approach, I think, is is just so important. And when you look at you know some of the best products out there today, it's all iterative. And because software or because a lot of products now have software components, you're looking at things with those like SaaS sort of models as as being sort of the be all and end all right now. Um, companies now have an opportunity like never before to continue iterating their products. Would you say that's something that that small businesses can take on or not small businesses, but small startups can take on almost as a superpower that these really large corporations, the Microsofts and the IBMs of the world are, are starting to struggle with really because they don't have that same agility. Yeah, I mean, a lot of large corporations have a code base they need to maintain, right? So making big changes is very hard because they, there's backwards compatibility that they have to manage. There's legacy clients they have to manage, all that stuff. The nice thing with startups is that you can pivot quickly. And the thing that we want to focus on is making sure that you're pivoting quickly early. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, things don't change, right? Like after you've launched a product, this, this process doesn't go, oh, look, you did it once, you're done. Let's be happy and move on. Mm -hmm. It's as soon as you start to see a change in the market, you run through the process again. Sometimes that means you need to make changes to the product, but sometimes it's literally just the product is the product. We're going to tell a different story. We're going to tell a slightly different story and appeal to a slightly broader audience or a different audience to get them engaged and to, to re-engage with us. So the nice thing is that this is something that, I mean, it definitely applies to the early stage startups, but it doesn't end there. It, it never ends. You're always constantly iterating and leveraging a good testing methodology allows you to get to a place where, you know, whether you're brand new, a year old or five years old, you use that same methodology again. I mean, I say again, in five years, it's probably going to change it completely. But um, you use a, a, a testing methodology again to understand what the current market need is, the current identification of the, the high priority pain points, and you make changes, right? So it's, it's always about that reiteration and change. When you look at the landscape of product development and design now, it, it's it's highly competitive, right? You've got new products that are sort of launching all the time. How are you and your team sort of staying on top of those trends? And how do you suggest that, you know, the companies that maybe are joining us today take a look at market and, and how often are they assessing what changes are being sort of made? So I tend to align it to product cycles. Um, and it, it, to me, it's just because that's where you'll get focus again, right? Um, as much as I would love for this to be a constant thing where everybody's doing this all of the time, I, I know that's not realistic. But when you're starting to look at your next product or the next iteration or the next release, that's when I want you to go back and understand what's going on in the market. Look at what new competitors have come out. There are so many fantastic tools. I mean, back in the day when we did competitive research, it was you had to go and you had to buy a product and then you would try it out and see how it works, right? There are so many other ways of doing that now. There are so many tools available for understanding the audience, the traffic flow, what the needs are. And you don't have to go buy the product to figure it out. You can see just from web analytics how people are behaving and what they're looking for. But then there's also that, that UX component, right? Where sometimes it's about going back to fundamentals and, and re-interviewing your clients. And sometimes it's about talking to the people that are already engaged in your product. And sometimes it's about people who left your product. And sometimes it's about, you know, the market that you think you should maybe go after. So for me, when you're about to release a new product, every time you're about to release a new iteration or you're, you're thinking about what's coming next, that's when you want to go back into the market and see how things are going. Or in the worst case scenario where you've launched a product and it's doing well, and then all of a sudden it starts to drop off that's when you need to immediately look at what's changed in the market. Either a new offerings come up that's more compelling, or sometimes it's just that you have a competitor who's realized that you're making a dent in their business and they're going after you hard. And there's always an opportunity to recoup from that because typically you've created a product that's differentiated from you know mm -hmm. the Microsofts and IBMs in the world. And sometimes it's about doubling down on that differentiation. Very interesting. So many, so many cool little nuggets here to, to take away from. I want to touch really brief, briefly on resource requirements. So you're running these tests. Um, how much is it going to cost me as a startup owner? Is it, you know, in the thousands of dollars? What am I looking at from that cost perspective for this early part of it? 
Yeah, so it, it's it's normally, um, you know, let's say about $30 a test. Um, and depending on how well you do, you could do it in three or four tests. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but we're still talking hundreds of dollars, not even thousands, right? This is just about leveraging market signals to, again, be 80% right, figure out what you need to do, what are the big changes, and honestly, are you hitting that mark or not? And so it's it's not about a ton of time and ton of resources. It's just about going through the, the practice of testing, right? That validation and verification is a huge part of making sure you're building a product that people will buy. How important is that when you move to that next stage? You've got the validation, you've got sort of your data at play. How do you use that to sort of fuel that next iteration of your product to get it to the market? What does that sort of look like as part of the process? Yeah, so... And I mean, this seems weird, but it's basically you do the same thing again, right? Um, but the the idea is that like we so the course that, that we we've agreed to like you know partner with you on is one where it's, it's targeted more towards that that telling a good story, right? Can I draw people in? Can I make sure that I have something that's that's real and 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 people care about it? Um, after that, you know, for me, the testing never ends. It it gets into like okay, great, now I'm going to build you know, a product page. Great. Let's test variations on that because there's so much research that talks about how small changes, very small changes, like the, the color of button can have a huge impact on, you know, whether or not you're successful and profitable. A, a lot of e-commerce stores, you know, you, they start out and they have a terrible conversion rate. Instead of taking the approach of, oh, I have to drop my entire website. Actually, this is something that I absolutely hate. It's when people tell me, oh, well, I have a website, it's not working. So I've redeveloped an entire new website and I'm going to publish that and see how it works. It's like, well, great. But now, instead of changing a couple variables and seeing how it's going to improve, you've scrapped everything and you're starting over. The reality is, is that making a high converting site isn't about you know scrapping everything and starting over. It's about making small incremental changes to go from, you know, fractions of a percent higher conversion rate, but you start compounding those and all of a sudden you have an incredibly successful business. Yeah, I love that it's sort of everything you do starts and ends at that iteration of, of taking a look at what have you found and, and how do you sort of incrementally make it, make it a little bit better. Um, you know, when you're looking at uh, steps to sort of mitigate potential failures, um, do you even worry about that? Or do you worry about the mistakes or the missteps or the failures? Or is that something that you sort of embrace as part of this journey of testing out whether or not this product or idea is, is worth sort of bringing to market? Yeah, so, uh, you know, again, in the startup world, you hear this all the time, you know, fail fast. And I, I again, I, I, I find that a weird terminology, right? Like, I, I don't want you to fail fast. I want you to test because, if you're testing, it's about trying to ensure that you're less likely to fail. Or if you do fail, you fail at a stage where you can pivot or pull the plug, right? Like having a clear understanding in the really early stages that this, this has traction or potential at all is a huge thing that I think is often overlooked. It's not about getting into market and failing fast because that could be devastating. It's about doing small incremental tests figure out where the opportunities are and doubling down on the things that are working, right? Failure is a part of startups. It, it just, it is, it always is. It always will be. But being able to run tests to build better confidence. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that leveraging our methodology is going to give you a hundred percent success rate because that's impossible, but it gives you the confidence to proceed. Right. And the thing that I care the most is about is helping people understand that sometimes their assumptions are wrong, but if they hit something great, double down on that and build towards that solution. I think what you just said there about giving them the confidence to proceed, I think is one of the most important things um, I know that we do as sort of coaches to entrepreneurs here at We Tech Alliance. It's, it's that idea that taking that first step is oftentimes the scariest and the biggest, but once you start to build that momentum, it's so much easier to start moving through the process and sort of getting, getting uh, you know, the steam going. 
what do you say to someone that approaches you and says, you know, I've got this great idea for a product, but I'm afraid that if it gets out there, that people are going to steal the idea um, or that, you know, that idea is going to be taken and, and sort of snapped up and that it won't be mine anymore to, to control or to turn into a product. How do you approach someone like that when they're, they're starting to engage in this sort of testing sort of scenario? I mean, there's, there's two different sides of this. One is that, you know, we, we hear this a lot about, well, I don't want to talk about my idea because somebody's going to steal it. The thing is, is that people will steal ideas, but they typically steal ideas that are proven to be profitable, right? They're going to rip off somebody who is making something that's already making millions of dollars because otherwise they're in the same position as you, right? And it's, startups aren't for everybody. And a lot of people don't want to take that risk. So sometimes being able to be a little bit more open about what you're doing in the early stages to see if you can generate traffic can be way better than hiding it and keeping it totally secret. The other thing is that sometimes you don't have to talk about the specifics, right? Like I've done a lot of patent work in my life. And sometimes when we start talking about a product long before you know there's something out there and we don't want to disclose it because we don't want to invalidate our own patent, we can talk about the benefit. We could talk about the, the, the things that it will provide that are going to make life better, right? We could talk around the solution without giving away the specifics because you know specifics are the thing that really matter. That's the differentiation between a good product and a terrible one. So really trying to make sure that you're you know, giving out enough information to validate that there's real interest, but also, you know, talk about your solution in terms of the benefit and the value that it's going to provide, because that's yeah. the thing that will drive traction and show real engagement. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to sort of not sharing the magic behind the scenes, but sort of showing off, you know, what, what it can do, what the difference it's going to make, right? Or what, what pain point it's going to alleviate. Um, people don't always need to know sort of how, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so it looks like, honestly, we've, we've been burning through a lot of the, the questions that people have sent to us, just sort of answering them throughout our conversation. But uh, I had one more sort of topic conversation before we move into the Q&A. And that sure. is like, what is the most... Um, what's the most uh, valuable experience that you get from leading Snappy? What, what's been your favorite part leading this incredible organization? Uh, so honestly, my, my absolute favorite part is that, so we, we, have a, we have a weird organizational structure here that I'm super proud of. I, I love how we work. Um, but the biggest thing, the most successful thing that I ever think I ever experienced in my entire experience here was when a co-op told me to fuck off. And, and it was because I was wrong. And I was like, oh shit, you're right. Like there's that culture of people being able to tell, you know, me, the scary CEO, that I'm wrong is brilliant, right? Like that's what I want. And that we, we have this expression here of like, you know, when you come work with us, we we don't always deliver what you ask for, we deliver what you need. And it's because we want to push. We, we want to have that open, honest collaboration with our clients and within our own team to make sure that what we're doing has meaning, right? Like, I don't want to take somebody's money and build a product that I don't think will ever get sold. I want to build something that's going to be incredibly successful. It, it looks good on me. It looks good on yeah. them. Like, why wouldn't I want that? So instead of just, you know, taking money and building stuff, I, I want to make sure that everybody here feels comfortable to push back and fight for what they think is the right thing to do and doing it in a way that's, you know, compassionate and caring to all the people around them, but really trying to drive everybody to move forward and, and do better. In the last, uh, in the last couple of years, WeTech has sort of grown from a, a team of four to a, a team of 12. And um, we did a lot of work as directors on, you know, how do we shape organizational culture and what's important? And, and what you're describing there is the fact that you've built so much trust on your team that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to dissent uh, from the norm and, and create sort of a, a space that's safe in order to do that in. Um, and I think that's really unique and it's something that we sort of pride ourselves on, but also something that I know we have to get our new employees used to as they join us. Cause when they see us going head to head, sometimes they're like, oh geez, like, was that, you know, a real, did you really disagree there? And it's like, we really did, but we comes from such a place of respect that, that you're able to move forward with sort of this, this unified sort of approach to it. So 
I just love that you sort of installed that and, and that's instilled in your staff. And I'm chuckling to myself thinking, uh, you know, our CEO is, is listening in on this and I'm bringing that fuck off energy to our next meeting. So. <laughs> We'll see how that goes. The one thing I will say is that it's, uh, again, I, I, I love personality profiling and, and understanding how different personalities respond to conflict and, and knowing how to get the best out of people is a big part of that too, right? It's, it's not just telling people to fuck off. It's about understanding that some people need time and space to go away and come back with a great solution yeah. and affording them the, the flexibility and the trust, the transparency to go do that is, is something I love. That's so cool. And I hope that translates to, to all of the companies that you end up working with in the entrepreneurs, because I can tell you that it that it really does benefit them. We sort of have a saying here that there's no whisper fights at WeTech. And it's this idea that we don't sort of click off and disagree on something and then go talk to our neighbor about how pissed off we are at the decision. It's something that we can discuss as the broader team and walk away knowing that like I had my ideas heard, I had my opinion heard. We're gonna move forward, even though I don't just dis- I don't agree necessarily with the direction. I agree with the fact that we all have the same goal at the end of the day. Um, and I just think that's so cool that you're sort of instilling that uh, on the teams. So we've got a bit of a Q&A here and we've got uh, a few minutes left. Um, someone asked, uh, how about running a Kickstarter project to see if there's traction? You know, is that a valid way or something that you, you're a proponent of? Uh, so Kickstarter can be great. The, the downfall with Kickstarter is because it has become such a popular thing if you don't have a, a good following, the likelihood of your Kickstarter campaign being successful is, is not awesome. Um, so Kickstarters are awesome if you've already started to build up that trust. So leveraging the right messaging, the storytelling, and all of those things to build up a following, you know, build up a good Facebook page, build up a good Instagram following, whatever you, you leverage in terms of socials or just in terms of followings and general mailing lists, having a good base means that you're far more likely to succeed, right? Because of also how Kickstarter's algorithm works in terms of what it puts in front of people. So Kickstarters can be great, but be mindful that they're not like they used to be where it's like, I'm going to put out an idea and maybe it'll get funded. Yeah, There's so much noise on that space that you need to have a following before you can really leverage that platform. Also add to that too, I know there's a very specific formula that you can run on Kickstarter now as well, where it's like, you know, having a war chest so that you're you're putting in uh, a big portion of, of what you're looking to raise in the early days. So that way you, you, know, you rank higher on the algorithm, stuff like that. So yeah. there's quite a few, I think, tips and tricks into those sort of crowdfunding sites that you can look at leveraging. There's more of a strategy. It's not just sort of putting it out there. I think yeah. that, that sort of dovetails into this next question is, you know, someone asked, you know, what is the best way to let people know if I've got sort of a new product, it's out in market, how do I get people's eyes on it that, that it, maybe it's not an intuitive way or um, it's not a way that, that I would sort of think of? What's that best way to sort of get people engaged in that new product for you? So the, the, the best and worst answer is I have no idea. Um, every market's a little bit different, right? Uh, so the thing, yeah, unfortunately, my answers are all going to be test it and find out. <laughs> um, but I, I actually really believe that is that sometimes finding your audience can be through a, a, a channel, right? Through a distribution channel or through a partner channel. Sometimes it can be through social. Uh, honestly, like a lot of people hate Facebook. I, I get it. But there's also a lot of people on Facebook. Uh, we, we've done products even for medical devices selling to doctors, and we can still leverage paid advertising to reach those people fast, right? And for cheap. Um, the, the thing is that every market's a little bit different. And so you kind of have to just try and see what's going to resonate with your market. And then, you know, again, double down on the things that work best and get rid of the things that don't. For sure. I think um, here's a really good one where, and it might be just be answered within the methodology that you use, but how do you help to distinguish between something that's condescending feedback versus something that's like actually constructive, you know, brutal, but ominous? What's the difference there? How are you, te- how are you testing for, for what that difference is? So, I mean, that's, there's two different answers. Like if you're talking about the market, um, <laughs> the internet is a weird place. Uh, uh, we actually use Reddit for, for some of our oh, market research. That's where uh, to get the most brutal feedback ever. <laughs> Reddit is is the place where the internet goes to complain. Um, but it, it's really interesting because you can even find opportunity in that, right? If they're complaining about your competitor's product, finding unique differentiation of like why they're complaining, that's really valuable. If, if you get somebody who just says like, 
I don't know, Asana sucks, you should use whatever. It's like, that's that's not valuable. But if they tell you why, there's, there's value in that. Um, if it's between like employees, that is something where there needs to be a level of understanding set, right? Um, negative feedback without explaining why is, is bullshit. Like I have a rule here where if you say no to anything, you have to be able to justify with logical rationale as to why. If you can't, then it's an opinion. And I don't give a shit about your opinion. Right. And the thing is that it's also, I, I want to know the market's thoughts. I, I don't want to know my staff's thoughts. I want to know what does the market think? So anytime you get feedback that's negative, if there's no justification as to or qualification as to why it's negative, why it's bad, why it's wrong, it's not good feedback. It always has to be followed up. And to be completely clear, I believe in intuition, but I also know intuition is based off experience. There are times where I'll say, I don't like that. And I'm not sure why yet, but I will think about it and I will come back to you and I will tell you why. And if I can't come up with an answer, my disagreement is invalid, right? And so it's mm -hmm. always about making sure arguments are arguments are they're great, but there needs to be follow up. There needs to be discussion. There needs to be explanation. And without that, arguments are just arguments and not very valuable. So Stephen, we're coming to sort of the end of our conversation and I've got some takeaways and I want to sort of throw it back to you for your key takeaway too. So here's what I'm leaving with. One is you're never too early to leverage data to grow your company, whether or not it's just an idea, you're a startup, you're a scale scale up wherever you are at in their journey, you can use a testing methodology to make your company exponentially better over time, over iteration. The next is that the loop that you should be using for your business development piece isn't build, measure, learn, but look at test, measure, learn, build, and wash and repeat. You're going to keep doing that until the end of time because, you know, game theory, your business is never done. You're always going to be developing it out. You're always going to want to get in front of new customers or, or reconnect with customers that already exist. So keeping in mind that that, that sort of four-step sort of process. Next is you want to make sure that you're validating without bias. It's so easy to build our bias into the validation methods that we use. So taking a look at how we're doing that and building questions that eliminate the bias and aren't leading. Um, and next and finally that, that I have sort of to take away here is making sure that you're working on one variable at a time. Don't scrap everything that you do to replace it with the newest, best, next thing. Iterate slowly, one variable at a time, test Measure, learn, build, repeat. Iterate, iterate <laughs> quickly, but with one variable. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, any other takeaways that, that folks listening in should, should be taken away from this conversation? And, I mean, honestly, weirdly, this whole conversation gets summed up with the opinion of, oh, you should test everything. Yeah. <laughs> As, the thing that I love, though, is that there's, there's the old way of doing things where it's like, go do a survey, go do a focus group. All that stuff is, it's garbage now. It doesn't work. And the thing that I'm encouraging people to do is go and explore new ways. Go explore ways where you don't introduce bias and get real results. Stop trusting your assumptions, your, your mentor's assumptions, everybody's assumptions. And if it's good advice, great, but validate it. That's all. Just make sure that whatever you're doing has some evidence to support it. I love that. Steven, thank you so much for sharing your founder's journey with us today and insights you've learned over your time in working in product development. On behalf of Tech Week YQG, we can't wait to celebrate your continued growth and success and are looking forward to kicking off that new partnership. I know we've got a meeting uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks with the first client to go through your program. And I'm so excited to learn more about it. And I know our advisory team is as well. To our virtual audience today, thank you so much for joining us for Tech Founder Day. We hope you found the event informative and engaging. We have an absolutely full lineup of outstanding events coming up throughout the week um, and lots and lots of more things for you to sort of engage in. So please stay tuned. Um, other things to keep in mind, we've got uh, Tech Mobility Day coming up tomorrow, which is an EV showcase happening at the Automobility Innovation Center. And Friday, we'll have another conversation with myself for Tech Green Day, um, which is another virtual event featuring Next Innovations, a BC-based company with new roots in Windsor, Essex. Now, your feedback is so important to us, and so I please ask that you take a quick moment to answer the following poll that just popped up on your screen. If you have any other feedback, please share it via email at info at wetech-alliance.com. 
And if you are a company or entrepreneur with an innovative or a tech idea and you're looking to scale, we encourage you to reach out to our venture services team to set up a discovery meeting. We look forward to connecting with you and supporting your growth. Everyone have such a great day. Steven, thank you again so much for being here with us. And we look forward to working with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care, everyone.